but I would love for you to give um, one by one a brief bio of your background in film and TV. Like, started out as a PA, worked my way up to this, or always just came in at this level. How did you find your way into our business? Um, how did I find my way? Um, boy, how far back should I go? <laughs> Broad strokes. Broad strokes. <laughs> Um, I always kind of knew I wanted to be in this business of storytelling. I didn't know exactly how, so I sort of dabbled in a number of different things. But um, I, I, I wanted to get my feet wet and kind of, you know, try and figure out what aspect of it I wanted to do. And I was always kind of writing. So writing, I knew writing was a big part of it, but I knew nothing about the film industry. So I think it was in my early 20s when I started PAing, and I, was vi I very quickly realized that was not going to be the route that I was going to take. <laughs> Um, and uh, at the same time, like I just took a gamble and was like, I think I need to go to film school. Like I think film school will be the way for me to kind of figure out what aspect of this industry is right for me. So I applied to two schools, NYU and Columbia, and I got into Columbia, which which happened to be my first choice. And um, that was where I really learned everything about the industry. I mean, I went I went in just knowing that I had this desire to tell stories, and I had a few stories that I was burning to tell. And I knew nothing about what a director did. I mean, I'd taken like a photography class in high school. That was the extent of my knowledge. Um, and other than that, it was just like writing, you know, creative writing and short stories. And then I, um, I started writing my, you know, I started writing a number of feature films there, but the second feature screenplay I wrote ended up being my first feature film, Emrica. And um, I mean, it, it was, I, I had a lot of balls basically taking out a huge loan and going to film school. I had absolutely no reason to believe that I couldn't make movies, but it was just, you know, kind of sheer determination and um, and tenacity that I think got me there. What about you? Um, well, I started out as an actor. Um, so I went to Carnegie Mellon for theater and moved to New York and worked as an actor in New York and did um, theater and the shows you do when you're an actor in New York, Law and Order and <laughs> all of, you know, Law and Order SVU and <laughs> Law and Order, whatever else there was. Um, and then I, uh, I moved out to LA, um, just sort of was living this like bi-coastal actor life and, and then moved to LA and was totally miserable when I moved to LA. I thought it was a horrible place. Um, and and had all this free time, and so I really, I had always been a writer, and I, but I started writing in earnest, um, and wrote uh, a couple screenplays, and then I ended up applying to AFI, to the Directing Workshop for Women, um, and got into that program, and made my first short film through that program, and then that film um, went to Cannes, and uh, won an award at Cannes, and was like, kind of a wild journey, because suddenly I, you know, it was like, oh, you're a filmmaker, and and um, and I came back, and I through that, I ended up getting a literary agent, and um, and then ended up writing a couple pilots for TV, and then wrote on the series Men of a Certain Age, um, and uh, really loved being in a writer's room. I think TV, uh, you know, I always wrote so that I could direct. Like I always sort of had that. Um, but writing is a very isolating thing, and suddenly a writer's room was like, oh, this is amazing. I get to tell stories and be involved in social and use other people's brains. And, and so then I went from Men of a Certain Age um, to Orange is the New Black um, and wrote on that from the beginning. And the whole time that I was doing this, I had was developing my short film into a feature. Um, and so that feature took a really long time. That took eight years to get made. And in the time I was writing on these various TV shows and every time in my hiatus, I would really push to get my feature going. And um, you know, you'd have an actor attached and it, it came together and fell apart many times over the years. Um, and then finally, I was into season four of Orange is the New Black two weeks into the writer's room and my movie got greenlit. And in the time I had also made a couple more short films. Um, and the film got greenlit, and so I went off and left Orange and went and made that film, and, and then that's been its own ride, so that's kind of my journey. Uh, let me see. I think we kind of all have kind of similar tracks of how we got there. Um, for me, I grew up in Mississippi, was going to go to law school. No one is really making films in Mississippi, if you hadn't noticed. 
Uh, and so it never really seemed as a possibility for me. Uh, I watched two films my last semester. I'm studying for the LSAT, Gina Prince Bythewood's Love and Basketball, and Kimberly Pierce's Boys Don't Cry. Mm -hmm. And those two movies moved me in such a certain way, and to watch those end credits roll up, written and directed by, and to see a woman's name behind both those two powerful films made me say, well, the hell with going to law school, I'm gonna go get debt somewhere else. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up uh, applying to NYU, Columbia, Kimberly's alma mater, and UCLA, Gina's, and USC. I got rejected from NYU, Columbia, <laughs> UCLA, and USC was my first choice, and I was waiting. I hadn't heard. I had a departure date from Mississippi, got in the U-Haul, drove over with no job, no money, sold meat over the phone to vegetarians in California. So you can imagine I was like the best telemarketer for selling me ever. And then uh, after being out here for like a month, I got a letter from USC and I got in. And so that was how I got into film um, with it because I always had a passion for telling stories. It just, I didn't know anything about filmmaking. I too, I was like, I don't really know what a director does. We got, I, we got very similar stories. Yeah, I'm like, Kimberly, I had, Kimberly Pearson inspired me to go to Columbia, actually. Did she? Yeah, so Kimberly, wherever you are, thank you. Yes, thank you, Kimberly, please. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, and so basically, I went to film school, ended up, thankfully, getting opportunity to co-write a comedy for Jamie Babbitt, Itty Bitty Titty Committee. Um, and then I just couldn't really find like a job. So I was working in a group home. Uh, continued to write. I was writing and started working on Mississippi Damned at that time um, while I was doing my overnights <laughs> and working there. Um, and then Film Independent, they're the ones that gave me that leg up. Um, my producing partner, manager, wife, editor, and just my lifeline um, was with, you know, we did every single program Film Independent has every last one. Um, and Josh Welsh, Jennifer Kushner, they were just so instrumental in making sure that we got the film made. Um, and it was the first feature to write and direct and it's two time periods, 36 characters, 115 page scripts and shooting it in 21 days. We had a tornado on day one. And people were like, y'all are crazy. And we're like, yep, but we have a passion. <laughs> and yeah taking out loans, same thing, trying to make that happen. So, um, and then it eventually led where Mississippi Dam just, you know, really was kind of flounder. It did great on the festival circuit, but just really couldn't find that distribution that it needed. Um, and eventually, I finally got into TV. Uh, Ava DuVernay um, approached me about producing on Queen Sugar. And um, a week later, after I accepted it, Gina wrote me about Shots Fired. <laughs> to come right on there, so I couldn't take it. Yeah. Um, and so, but that's how things kind of got turned around for me, and yeah, and it's become a hyphenate, and being able to make it in TV when people said, you can't be a hyphenate, whether that be an actor, director, writer, or a writer-director, so that's kind of my story. And I feel like it's, it's the same story. Um, so, you know, I grew up here, but my parents came from India, and so there was nobody that was sort of saying this is an industry that is an option for you to work in. It was like, you know, no idea what a director did, no idea that, I guess I was one of those people that turned on TV and just thought those actors were making up what they said. Because now I'm like, how did I not know there was a writer's room, this thing happened? I don't know, it just didn't, it wasn't real to me. Um, but, you know, started PAing, like took it, when I figured out, I just had this passion for, always sort of told, told stories, was sneaking into screenwriting classes, and didn't really consider that that was something you should do full time, was doing it on the side of my pre-law major. <laughs> and then um, just all of a sudden thought, wait a minute, actually my roommate was like, that's what you're spending all day and night doing is sneaking into film classes and maybe there's something there, so why don't you do an internship? And an internship turned out to be like this really shitty PA job that I was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but I was trying to figure out how do you get to do that thing, that person that's making all the decisions. And they were like, that's the director. And I couldn't figure out where, the director seemed to be flown in from some secret location every time. There was no like <laughs> path to become the director. And I decided that secret location was film school. And so I applied to NYU. It was the only school I applied to because it was my number one choice. And then I got in. And when I was there, I, I was really happy and lucky to be a part of this just period of time where 
like New York City in the 90s was a very amazing indie film scene. And you just were going to make an independent film because if you wanted to, you were gonna do that with all of your power. And it was like, while, you know, right after Lisa Cheladenko was making High Art and Kimberly was making Boys Don't Cry, and suddenly, like, all these women and all these incredible, the Seychelle sisters, like, everybody was sort of making uh, Mo Grodnick, like, all these 90s amazing indie filmmakers were making independent films centering stories about women, which is all I ever wanted to tell was, like, the immigrant experience and stories about women. And so, finally, um, I just started writing a feature while I was in school, and um, I had the luck of being in Spike Lee's directing class, and he sort of took everyone aside and said, this place is your best chance at making a feature because it's a free equipment warehouse. So if you don't shoot one while you're here, you're gonna be stuck in an industry that doesn't give a shit about the story you're trying to tell. And it was a really big wake up call. So I had written, you know, also when you're in that small environment, you don't think like, oh, my story about an Indian American family and, um, and two sisters and one's a lesbian and one's gonna carry the baby for her straight, straight sister. You don't think that's not a commercial presence, <laughs> premise, you know, you think, of course, that's gonna be like every other movie that opens in the theater. Um, and so I was lucky that he gave us that advice and we shot it like just as, um, as a scrappy student film, like almost with, but you know, better because we all were working very hard on it. But um, that was the film that then I went to festivals and sort of suddenly you're a director because you made this film. And it's almost like it goes the other way. Like people start treating you like a director so you start acting like a director and then you get interviewed as a writer director and then you start thinking of yourself as a filmmaker and then suddenly it took like 10 years to take that title and say, oh, I am a filmmaker. And it's crazy how long it takes to do that in your own head, just turn that corner. But yeah, so then I guess industry-wise was struggling out here, trying to break into, I guess, TV. I was in New York for a long time and all my friends out here seemed to go into TV. And I finally moved here. And every time I went to go uh, try to direct TV, everybody said, you can't direct TV unless you've directed TV. And it was this like really bad catch-22. And it just, you shadow and you do these diversity programs, you do all this stuff and it never, nothing works. And then finally one day, um, my uh, Jamie Babbitt actually said, hey, there's this show, and the, the showrunner, Jill Soloway, is looking for a director that hasn't done TV. She wants somebody from indie film. You should go meet with her. And that changed everything. Now everyone in TV is like, come do TV. But nobody wanted anything <laughs> until one person just said, hey, let's get somebody who doesn't do TV. So That's a really good jumping off point because I think a lot of folks here want to know First of all, sustainability is such an issue unless you're one of the rare folks that, you know, <laughs> ha comes from a trust fund or this could be just any vocation. It could be handbags or polo ponies, like filmmaking, why not? Yeah. But if you don't have that, <laughs> trying to stay alive and, and sustain yourself, part of the equation, it seems, people are saying in tandem, I direct films and I want to direct TV or I direct TV or I work on television so that one can feed the other. And I think a lot of folks in general want to know how, like you broke through, all of you broke through in your own way. And we've just now learned sort of your journey here, but the advice part of how do you actually get in, like it is the, you know, cart before the, like it's all, it's the circle of like, well, you can't be in a writer's room until you've been in a writer, or you can't be in a, and how, what is the advice that you would give folks that you wish you would have gotten? To break into television, television in particular? Um, uh, well, I mean, you know, so much of it is about relationships, about like f looking for and nurturing relationships with people who are working in television. And, you know, I think for some of us, like I, I got, I got really lucky in that I was at film school at Columbia and, you know, not being one of those trust fund babies, I, I, I knew I had to really work my ass off. I was like, there's no other choice. I just took out this huge loan. I was terrified. And I was like... I've got it, and you know, I had no support. I totally relate. You know, it was like I was supposed to be a pre-med major, and <laughs> and it was just like totally going against everything my family knew and and wanted for me. So, I really knew I had to work extremely hard. Um, and I I met actually someone at Columbia who ended up um, becoming a really good friend, very close friend, and um, she wound up directing the pilot of The L Word. And when she um, a, a few years into The L Word. Uh, found out that the showrunner was looking for a junior writer. 
and someone who um, understood the war in Iraq or knew a little bit about the war in Iraq because they wanted to create a character on the show um, who had just returned from the war in Iraq and so they wanted kind of an authentic voice. And funny enough, it's sort of like you have to kind of know what you can offer because, you know, it was like, I, I feel like I've only ever been hired as kind of like an authentic voice of like the Middle Eastern people, you know? It's just like I somehow represent like an entire region Doing and I'm job. happy to do that. I mean, it's a burden of responsibility. Um, at times it's really challenging and sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do that, you know? But um, but it's also kind of, it's kind of great and it's, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I'm here, you know? It's like to, I've always felt a responsibility to kind of be, a voice for the voiceless, and in this, you know, in this instance, I'm Palestinian American. In case I didn't state that, so um, so I got hired on the L Word, and um, and I, I worked as a staff writer on that show for three years uh, while I was developing my first feature, and so um, that was kind of a, a fluke of like meeting the right person and really connecting with that person and um, and seeing an opportunity and kind of going for it, and then funny enough. Um, you know, I, when I finally got my first feature made and then once again, you know, you think at first you make a feature and you're like, oh my God, I've made it. It's going to be so much easier. <laughs> and then you're like, oh wow, it's not. Like, it's, it's actually harder because now you have the experience of having worked your ass off making your first feature and now you've got to, now you know what it entails and you've got to do it all over again um, with, again, very little support. So it's, um, so it's almost ch more challenging the second time around. And I kind of avoided TV during that experience and found some other outlets, but, um, and again, I was trying to direct, um, and no one would let me direct because I hadn't directed before television. So I, um, and my agent at one point literally said, it's actually easier to sell a show than it is to break into directing episodic. So I started developing shows, and I actually, you know, I, I wound up almost selling one, but getting like a deal at 20th Century Fox, a blind pilot deal. So I made some inroads there, but then, long story short, I made my second feature, and then the showrunner um, on Empire ended up being the creator of the L Word, and someone who I'd kept in touch with, and someone who you know um, I had had a wonderful experience working with, and so I reached out to her, and it's just a testament to like again like having those relationships, building those relationships, and nurturing them, because she gave me my first break in directing television. And she had to fight for me, and she was willing to do it because she had worked with me for three years. And so she knew, she trusted me, and she knew what I brought to the table. Um, and that was how I wound up directing that episode. And that went so well that they actually then offered me um, a staffing position the following year, which is where I'm at right now, um, writing, directing, and producing on the show, while developing, you know, my next my next feature. So, um, yeah, it's all about building building and nurturing relationships. Um, I think, I mean, it's interesting to hear all of you guys talk too, because I think the thing, the common thread with all four of us is that we all made feature films that were very personal um, and very true to our voice and our experience. Um, and maybe an experience that only we could have had, you know? And I think that, you know, while I made, you know, sort of, my television career happened before my feature happened, that feature script, like the success of my short and my feature script got me everything in TV that I got, you know, I was hired on Orange is the New Black off of that feature script. I was hired on Men of a Certain Age off of, you know, so actually off of my short, like they had, the showrunner had seen my short film. So um, I think, and my advice is, I think there was a time when people were trying to um, adjust their own um, aesthetic or, or t you know, whatever to the show that they were trying to get on. And I, I think, you know, for me, knowing who I am and what my voice is and what I specifically bring to the table has been really invaluable, I think, in terms of getting hired and people wanting me for exactly what I do. Um, and it's meant that I have written on shows that are very, very close to my own tone and how I, you know, Orange was such a relief when I got to write on that show because I didn't, you know, I didn't have to alter anything about who I was to fit into that voice. Like it had the same kind of blend of darkness and humor and 
all of that. And so in a way, I think, you know, Genji, I know, who who is the showrunner and creator of that show, like she hires a lot of playwrights. She hires people off of, you know, essays, like not necessarily even, and I think Jill is similar, like she, th that it's not necessarily like that you write a spec script anymore and that they're like, oh, look, you can write a new girl just like the new girl episodes that we do. It's more like, oh, wow, this person has an eye-catching voice that is new and fresh and I've never seen this before and I want them, I want to take their creativity and bring it into my own project. So, so my advice really is to, to pursue your own work, you know, and tell stories not because you think they are commercial or will catch the eye of a certain person or, but because you're passionate and inspired by that story and it's a story that, that you wake up thinking about and that, you know, is in your gut that you feel has to be told. Um, and I think those are generally the things that I've seen lead to success for people. Um, and so, you know, I also is nurturing the right connections and having the people. So it's that combination of having the work and then, and then putting yourself out there in a brave way. I mean, I had no, no right to be putting myself out there for TV. I sat next to Mike Royce, who was the showrunner of Men of a Certain Age. I'd been watching the show. I sat next to him at a dinner party. He had seen my short film and was like, I loved your short film. And I was like, really? Do you need a writer on your show? You know, and, and that was something I would never have, like, I don't know what came out of me in that moment, but, um, and I think he was in a place where they were writing a show about middle-aged men, and it was like, oh, here's this young woman who seems like an interesting voice, and that might be a different perspective to bring into that writer's room. And so it just happened that I had the nerve to ask for that you know, at a time when he had seen something that I'd done. So, um, you know, I don't know that there's, it's all a very circuitous path, so it's not that there's clear directive of how to pursue it, but I think, I think being true to the kind of storyteller you are um, and honoring that goes a really long way. Um, and that executing your stuff sort of well, you know, it's, it's just as hard to make a bad thing as a good thing, so like make it a good thing. <laughs> yeah, and I guess I'll just kind of pick, piggyback on that of the fact of what you're making and what your voice is. Um, and I feel like as a writer, sometimes it takes you a while to really find your voice on the page. You know the stories you want to tell, but to really make sure that whoever's reading you will get it. Um, and yeah, like it's not so much spec scripts. Yeah, no one wants to see what you can do with New Girl. No, they want to know what your personal voice is, and that's what they're reading um, now. And for me, you know, it became off an original pilot that I wrote from working at a group group home <laughs> that I thought that was like, I'm in the dead end of my life, I'm not doing anything in film, but turns out to be something that is something that's extremely instrumental in my career. And so, and I also found that ma making Mississippi Damned was that they needed to see something. Um, and to make a feature was the way to do it. It was an expensive ass calling card that didn't really pay itself back immediately. But it's paid itself back so much over this right now because I would not be sitting here, I wouldn't be directing. That's the thing, I mean, as we're saying, everyone's kind of echoing how hard it is to fight. Okay, yeah, you haven't done TV before. Well, I need to do it, right, to do it. It's like, how do I get out of this catch-22? And the thing is about having someone take a chance on you. And I just always try to go back and remember all those rejection letters from you guys' schools, and then thinking about, it doesn't matter, about all the no's is about getting a one yes. And, you know, Ava gave me that one yes on Queen Sugar, and as soon as I directed those two episodes, bam, bam, here comes some more. But you're still fighting, even after that that you do have that um, on there. But yeah, you get, you have to make connections, be it, uh, you know, I started with, like I said, film independent and going through it and who you meet and making sure to foster the meaningful relationships, doing different programs. We met through ITVS, uh -huh. <laughs> doing feature states. So, but making sure that you also are continuing to write. And it is so tormenting, yeah, when you're not in a room. 
because it's so lonely. But when you do get a chance to be in a room, you see yourself light up in a way that you're like, oh my God, I am having fun and I actually got someone to bounce this off of. And I don't feel like I'm crazy talking to myself in a room. So it's really good. But the thing is, I think you, you, if you don't believe in what you're doing and what you have to say as an artist, I don't think you can sustain yourself long in this career because it's so hard. You have to do it because you love it, not because you think you're gonna get paid for it. Um, and I kind of always kind of think about what my dad said is like, figure out, you know, do what you would do for free and figure out a way to get paid for it. And somehow we've convinced people to pay us. Now, it took a long ass time. But I'm like, and that's why, have fun with it. Enjoy yourself. Don't ruin any kind of moment. Don't take it for granted. And to make sure that the connections that we had and we had to go through, well, how do we help you guys coming up next? How do we be that touchstone? How do we be that person that maybe helps you get to that next level? So for me, that's something that keeps me going and also just makes me think about the relationships that I've had in the past and the ones I continue to foster and hopefully that I can help people you know, not have to go over the hurdles that we've gone over um, or at least tell them how to get around it or at least give them a hand to jump over it. I mean, it's all, it's all the same sort of advice, but it is... Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of what, when I was at NYU, their sort of main school theory of the school was don't, don't add to the crap that's already out there. Like just try to do something original and different. And if you don't, then don't write or direct anything. Like they were just like, you know, maybe you should be an editor or maybe you should try, like do something else. Because if you don't really have something to say, then it's not gonna really, um, add to our culture, you know? And so I think that was, the, that's like their sort of harsh ass way of saying what we're saying, which is like to find, to find your voice and figure out, um, you know, how you can really contribute to the art. Because it is an art and you do, it is a, a amazingly wonderful collaborative and communal art. And so that to me is the, the joy of it now is to just embrace the artist side of it. Um, and then I read, you know, Amy Poehler's book because I'm always, always looking for advice. And her book said something really stunning, which was, you know, you work your ass off, like you work so hard and you just keep working. And then after 16 to 18 years, one of your friends will get famous enough to hire you. <laughs> and, and that's kind of what happened. Like it kind of, like for her, it was Tina Fey hired her. For me, Andrea Sperling got into the position of producing Transparent and said, yes, come in. Like you just keep working really, really hard. And um, nobody can deny that. You know, like when, t when Tina says we met at Future States, that was, um, you know, I, I know other filmmakers who said, oh, I'm not doing this short film for this on like online series. And I was like, okay, it's a genre I've never done. It's a chance to show if I can do it. It's um, a chance for me to try to break in. Like every time there was a, you can't do TV because you haven't done TV, I was like, well, maybe I'll make a 21 minute short and call it an episode and trick everyone into <laughs> thinking I did TV. And that kind of stuff works. Like you're just always trying to find the back door or a sideways in because you, you don't get in like straight through, you know, and I still have, I, I actually, Tina was just directing Dear White People and I'm doing an episode now and it was the first time, like I still, you know, never thought I could be at studio lots directing to the, like when I pull up to a gate and they ask for my ID and the gate goes open, a little part of me is still like, oh my God. I got in. Like they're letting me in. It's so amazing. And so, um, but usually I pull up, and then that amazing moment happens, and then I get to near where their production is, and I'm always greeted with, "Are you background?" And then I'm always like, "No, I'm here to work on the show," you know. And so when I pulled up to Dear White People, it was the first time that the, they said, are you here, are you directing the next episode? And I know it was because Tina was there before me. And so I sent her a text saying, thank you so much, this was the most amazing experience. <laughs> that they just assumed I was a director and not, not but, um, but also to like helping other people in, like we all, I am definitely, you'll find the people who sort of get in the door and then want to hold it open and be like, come on, everyone with me, let's get in now. And I think we're all of that mindset, you know, and I always want to try to bring more people in just because it makes 
the art better too and the show better and, and everything, but also to when that person takes a chance on you and I'm happy to do it because it makes me look really good too when I bring somebody amazing in who should have been in long ago. But um, once like someone said, oh, will you read the script and pass it to a producer and I read the script and it wasn't um, solid enough and I had to say like, oh, this script needs a lot of work. And their answer was, oh, I know, I just wasn't, um, I just wanted to get it to you quickly. And it made me realize like, oh, I never used to understand people being too busy to read a script, because I was like, who's so busy they can't read a script? But now I'm like, oh, it takes a lot of energy and time to read a script, and don't give your one that you already know needs work, you know, because now I don't, I, like when that email comes from her saying, oh, here's the next draft, it goes to the bottom of the pile of, oh, I rather would help this person who's trying really hard and struggling, you know. So I think that that's terrifying to me to think that if I was ever on that end of asking someone for help when I wasn't like ready. And then on the other end of that <laughs> advice spectrum is I was on a panel with um, Nora Ephron once and she gave this most amazing advice where she said, don't save your favors. Like women especially tend to wait and save to ask somebody for a favor. And she was like, don't save it, just ask. Like ask everybody, ask repeatedly. You don't run out of the amount of favors somebody will do for you, especially if you're delivering. You Unless know, it's so. reading a script. Unless it's reading a script. <laughs> yeah, but a, don't ask somebody uh, to read 10 drafts right. of your same yeah. script. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that was a big thing was if you know, if you have a connection to anyone anywhere, don't wait for the right moment. Like that dinner party story is amazing that you were just, hey, what about this? I mean, I had a, a interview for a show and um, just like, su like suggested in the same weirdo moment, like, hey, why don't Jamie and I just direct the whole season for you? And then the show owner was like, okay, yeah. And then, <laughs> then we did. And it was like crazy that you can just say things like that sometimes, but if you really mean it, it comes across to them, you know? <laughs> so switching gears a little bit more to the technical aspect of things, um, in terms of your personal style and incorporating it into a larger story as directors and sort of um, walking the line between this is a show that's established, how are you still able to incorporate your creativity and yourself into work? when you're being sort of plugged into that particular episode that you, maybe you did or didn't write. We were just talking about this right before. Um, do you want me to jump in? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just directed an episode of The Path on Hulu, and it was my first um, TV, like purely, like I wasn't involved in the show, coming in as a complete stranger for episode 12, you know? Um, yeah, and it was so challenging. I mean, I can't, it was a completely different muscle than either directing your own feature or producing episodes on a staff that you'd worked on. Um, and I found that it was just that exactly what you're talking about was a really weird line because I only know how to work how I've worked. Um, and the show has its own culture and the actors have their own culture, and the, there's a politics among everybody that you sort of have to insert yourself in, and you're the stranger, but you're, you know, like you're coming in and you have no one to eat lunch with, but you're the boss. Like, it's that weird feeling where you're like going to lunch and you're like, I have no one to sit with, oh my God. And, um, and everybody's like scared of you because you're the director. I mean, it's just this weird thing, but, um, and I found that was quite hard to, to go like, oh, I'm not supposed to give these actors notes, or like, I'm not um, in the editing room, like we talked about, you know, the editor was like, God, no director comes in and works with me in the editing room. Like, they watch it on pics and send me notes, and I was like, I wouldn't even know how to do that. Like, I love sitting with an editor and working, and, you know, I asked to see takes of a performance, and he was like, you look at takes of performance? And I was like, yeah, like, it's perform, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> But, I, but it's not to judge that show, it's a great show. It's that you don't have time, like you don't. And I actually made a mistake in my edit by going in and spending that much time like going back because I had three days, you know? And so it's like, you only really have time to give broad notes, get the whole shape of it working. Um, and on set, 
you don't really have the time either. You're trying to make your day, and that's the most important thing, really, in TV, is to make your day. Um, and so I found that it was trying to elevate whatever it was in the moment, whether it was like, this is a cool shot to come in, or, or what if I, I know it's not really the style of the show, but what if I did this scene in a one -er? Maybe I could get away with it. I'll shoot the one -er. I'll also shoot coverage. Maybe they'll let me use the one -er, you know? And so I think it was that. It was like, it's finding, you know, or when you're on staff on, in a writer's room, it's finding, you know, every episode tonally shifts a little bit to the writer who writes it. And so it's trying to find... Um, and it was shocking on Orange because we didn't have a pilot to work off. So when the first six episodes went out and we each wrote an episode, it came back and reading them was like, one was like an episode of The Shield and the next one was an episode of 30 Rock. You were like, what is this show? <laughs> like, None of us kind of had, I think, the voice of the show. Um, but I think that was the extreme version, but it did continue in a way where you knew on staff, like what was a Nick Jones episode, it was a little more absurd and a little funnier than, you know, or what was mine tended to be like a little bit more emotional. Like it's every writer kind of pulled it in a, in a direction. So it, it is a very tricky balance. And I just had this experience where I wasn't sure that I figured it out, but it definitely was, you know, a surprise to be like, you know, and we were talking about it because when it's your yeah. own movie, you're just, you do it your way and everybody's on board because it's your movie. Um, and it doesn't work like that in TV. It's, yeah, it's definitely tricky and every show is different. And I, that's one, I think, one of the most challenging things about it is like every episode you go into direct, you've got so much work to do in studying the show because you are going in, you are going in and trying to basically fit into a world that has already been created, a style that has already been created, a crew that is already hopefully working like a well-oiled machine. And if not, maybe it's a first season show and then you're even more screwed because they're not working as a well-oiled machine. And you don't, maybe, not, maybe no one knows what the vision of the show is yet, but it's not like you can go in and insert your own. So it's, you know, you're answering to someone. You're, you're trying to direct within someone else's vision. But you, as the director, are supposed to have a vision as well. So it is definitely um, very, very tricky. And I went, you know, I went into my experience on Empire, kind of knowing all of that and having had a lot of time to think about it in, in advance. And I had shadowed their producing director, which was a fantastic experience. Um, I think that they set me up to do that in order to kind of give me the opportunity to succeed on the show. It is a really challenging show with the musical performances and whatnot. Um, at the time, actually, I was staffed on a, on a show that was a first season show that was way more challenging in a way, so it made Empire look a little bit easier, which was kind of a gift. But I think the shadowing was really important because I really got to spend a lot of time with the producing director who very thoroughly outlined for me the look of the show. And I literally sat and took notes and I sat with her on set and I asked a lot of questions and you know, the actors improv, which is fantastic because I come from that world and I understand that world. Um, so there was, and, and what it kind of came down to was like really understanding the look of the show. You know, for example, with Empire, it's like they, you, they don't like close-ups. Like you don't do too many close-ups. You know, everything's like done in a cowboy and, and medium and you have to have a wide shot. Like everything, there has to be like a super wide shot in every scene. So it's like every show has its little, you know, it's kind of list of things that you have to keep in mind. But I think where you get to interject your own sense of vision and creativity and style is, is really in certain places where you try to elevate the material, where you look for what in TV they call specialty shots. And you look for like that cool opening shot. Or you look for like, oh, there's this moment where you know um, someone in season two of Empire, there was this um, moment where one of the uh, characters falls down the stairs. And the producing director just came up with this amazing, and this is when I was shadowing her, she came up with this really, really beautiful specialty shot. Um, and you know, another director might not have done that, but it really elevated what was on the page. So it was, it was. I think it's that kind of thing where it's that tricky balance of like, here's here are the kind of rules for this show. Here's the world. Here's the tone. Here's the way they like to shoot it. 
And then here are the places within this particular script that I got where I think I might be able to do something kind of cool or like bring my style or say something, maybe elaborate on this moment a little bit. Um, and you know, you look for those places and you don't want too many of those because you know, you're not going in there trying to be like, this is a Shireen Davis episode. You know, you're going in there trying to fit within the world while also making a little bit of a mark. So it, it, is, it is definitely a tricky balance. But I have to say, I, you know, when you're writing and directing your own material, at least for me, like I, you know, I, I'm so invested and I care so much and it's like, oh my God, the stakes are so high. And so when I went into television, it, it, and my second feature film was just, it was way too much of that. You know, it was like, and it, it, the experience was so challenging. I just wanted to be free. I was like, I want to get back to the creative part. I want to have a good time. It's, nothing is worth it if it's not fun. So I just went into my episode of television thinking the number one thing for me on this is to have fun. If I have fun and I can make an episode and I can make my days because that is extremely important in television and I can make an episode that makes the showrunner who gave me my big break, especially the showrunner, but also like the creators, like everyone who's involved in the show, if I can make them happy, then I will have succeeded. And I had a fantastic time. I mean, it was like so freeing and so fun that it was a huge lesson for me in how much fun making my own feature films could be if I would just let go a little. So that's what TV taught me so far. Uh, yeah, I mean, thankfully so far the episodes that I've been directing, I have not written. Um, and people often ask me, I'm on uh, Queen of the South now, and I'm gonna direct one of the episodes on that show as well, but I'm also a producer on the show, writing producer. Uh, and they were like, hey, do you wanna write your episode? And I was like, no, that I'm gonna direct. Not at all. I wanna really take another writer's vision and make sure that I can bring it to life. And I think that when it helps you do, to practice that, yeah, it's not, your show, it's, you know what I mean, in that sense, um, you have to make sure you elevate someone else's, bring that to life. Um, dear white people, uh, yeah, because I'm not on staff, I don't work on there, we're coming in as basically, we're your guests that have to make our days and have a good time. And for me, I love working with actors. That is the major thing that I love beyond anything else. And also making sure that I pretty much learn the name of every cast and crew member on every set that I go on. Um, and I make sure they get a big hug from me every day. Because, and I wanna know, yeah, after I do my tech scout and I'll say what I want, but yeah, I turn to my transpo guys, so tell me how this is gonna affect it, or G&E, like, if I wanna do this shot, how long is this gonna take? Because one, it is all gonna add on to, can I make my days? But two, I do know what your position entails. And I gotta make sure too, what your turnaround is. I don't want you driving home and having a wreck. I don't want you getting tired. Because yeah, we rap, we go home. Tired and working on the next thing, but we go home. No, they're rapping for two, three hours sometimes. After that, on top of that 12 hour day. Um, but also what I find is when you know the positions of where people do what they go through, they are much more appreciative. And that crew, they work much harder. And they, you know, it's, film is a collaborative process. Television, a collaborative process. No one does it by themselves. And as long as you remember that you are, t in my mind, in my eyes, I am no more important than the PA that's sitting there and just brought me a water, thankfully. I'm no better than you, I just happen to be a director. But no, we're equal as humans, um, and I'm going to treat you as such. Um, and just kind of going back to what I do love, of yeah, trying to add in a yeah, shot that does kind of fit, and it does feel like, oh, you know what? This is a Tina Mabry kind of shot. She somehow loves to look through POV of doors. I don't know, <laughs> like it's, that's kind of my thing, you know, but you know, but at the same time, on there are white people making sure that, yeah, we bring Justin's vision to life. This is his baby, making sure that it's all right. Checking to make sure that, you know, I think I got the, I know I got the performance that I wanted, but to make sure are the producers happy. Uh, but just playing that balance and then also just watching the politics of what happens. Um, and that's one of the hardest things to me to learn and that I'm trying to grapple and figure out how that works. And the best thing for me right now, while I don't have my own show, I just sit back and watch other people and see what works and what, where they fuck up, <laughs> honestly, and try not to screw up in the same ways. But 
I, you know, it kind of goes back to what Sharina's saying. It's like, yeah, have fun with it. Have a smile on your face. And yes, because you're setting the tone still for that set, even if you're visiting for this week. You need to do it. And I do sit down with my editor. And when I can't sit down, thankfully, I have a very good manager who was also an editor who will sit down and help and help break down. And we do paper edits. If I'm going to another, I'm in the room and I can't be there, but I'm still going to always come in and sit with an editor. But being able to know the terms that you can work with them, we can work much faster. I've got you working already early in the day. So by the time we come in, we can add that magic on top of it. But uh, yeah, you just don't have a lot of time. But yeah, make your days and have fun. <laughs> but if you, um, I was very thankful on Queen Sugar to have a great producing director, Nima Barnett. Um, she's the first black woman to ever direct on network television. And um, she was there as someone, if you needed help with anything, She'd let you do your own thing, didn't interfere. But if it was something of, no, you've been down here in New Orleans shooting on this set, you know which angles are gonna be best in this house. I need to get out of this scene within an hour. I'm thinking about doing this or where, she was like, yeah, he likes better from this direction. This is better for that. Of being able to have that and have someone that you know is completely behind your side. And she worked as a great mentor, as well as making sure that our production ran well. But um, yeah, I mean, I just think the thing is too, for me, I would just like to get into the material a lot to understand what's the intention behind every single line and to make sure that I make my actors feel comfortable. And you know, especially like my first day of Dear White People, I had preschoolers for the shot, first shot, and then I had to shoot sex scenes all day. <laughs> so, but talking to the actors beforehand to see what they were comfortable with, going over how I'm gonna shoot it, that made that go so much easier, and they felt so much more comfortable, and they start to trust us. So yeah, the more that I had to shoot more sex scenes <laughs> in it, you guys are gonna love this show, I'm telling you. <laughs> but um, the more, you know, they really rely, and they, they will trust you with it. And it's a season one show, but even as we're getting into Queen of the South, um, with season two, the actors have been coming in, and we get a chance to really talk to them about what, um, what, where they feel about their characters, how, where they're coming from. So that's gonna help in the directorial sense. But yeah, it's true, but I'm producing on the show, so yeah, I'm gonna know it inside and out um, as a writer, but um, just trying to make sure that I bring it to life in the best way possible without completely mimicking every shot from every other episode. Trying to bring something that I feel like Here's my contribution to help elevate this particular episode or episodes. I'm just listening to them and then realizing, well, it's probably good that I do everything totally wrong because I, <laughs> I take it all on like it's my own independent film and it's my thing and I get way too involved and too personal in all of it. And, um, but then I think I'm just more careful to not take a show that isn't like that because I think I would not be a good fit for that show and not it like it, that was a big discovery of like oh you are not everything isn't a good match you know and that is um, something I think going back to like what is your what is it that you do and um, do well but I think because my first experience in TV was being the only director with the creator of the show and being in the writer's room and being the producer director I didn't know from uh, the other, the sort of guest director experience, which is really challenging, really hard, and also um, not as creatively fulfilling, I think, at times, unless you can find like the sweet spot that they've all described so well. But I think um, for me, like I, I did have to, and also just knowing everything is different because I shadowed. Um, when I was going to do my first sort of TV episode, they um, you know, said, you can direct one, but you have to shadow the one before. And this is just before Transparent, when I did get to do one sort of hour long. And the person they had me shadow was another female director who, um, I don't know, I guess they were like, oh, let's put them together. And she was, I got to the set, and she kind of looked me like up and down and was like, okay, let's do this, you know, and then started directing and kept kind of looking back and I was like, I don't really know what, like, you know, it's awkward to shadow too because you're kind of in the way and you don't want to be in the way and you need to get information but you don't want 
to be invisible, but you are invisible. It's all, it's a very upsetting experience. <laughs> so, um, but she finally turned to me and she said, you can't learn from me what to do here. We are two totally different genres of people. And I was like, what? And she said, you can't push the crew the way I push the crew. Like, one, I've been doing the show forever, so they know me and they'll do things for me that they're not gonna do for you. And two, like, you're not the same kind of person. And I think it's a, it's, it's a thing where I don't like come on the set and take over and yell loudly. Like, I'm not, I, even if I've tried to make myself do that or act like a director, it doesn't work out and it's never my go-to. So I think that is something that can be a little frustrating in some experiences for people. And also, she had a really good point, which was you can't employ the tools other directors employ unless you are the same kind of person, you know? But, um, but yeah, so with that and then with Better Things, I was the only director as well with the creators of the show. So it was sort of, um, I get to get very immersed and very involved and make it really personal. And um, with Mr. Robot, it was, also, um, we had a very strict style guideline. Like, it was amazing that every frame had to have like 70 to 80% negative space. You could not move the camera um, in a tilt, a pan, or a zoom. If you were gonna move the camera, it had to be motivated. And it only had to move on a dolly. And so, that right away, mathematically, you're like, okay, how many dolly shots can I do in a day with this crew, and then how much time will that take? And then you knew right away, like, how stressed you were gonna to be to make this episode happen. Um, and you could not do handheld, and you couldn't, um, the close up was like on this lens at this, you know, at three feet, nine inches. Like that was the close up, and you don't go more than that. And, but then what I found was like, Sam and I were, were at NYU at the same time, so basically his rules were NYU film school rules. And it just was why my work spoke to him and why his work spoke to me was, oh, we get to go back to the, the thing of, don't just, because so many times on set, there are writers who will be like, the scene's really boring. Can you like move the camera? And I was like, well, can you rewrite the scene? Because I can like shake the camera all I want. I'm not going to make your kind of shitty scene better. But like, you know, that's not a thing you should say as like a guest director. But you can when you're the producer director. You can be like, yeah, this scene's not really working. That's like, Let's take apart the scene. And Jill Soloway was amazing at that. She was the first to like, she'd hand you, and I'm such a fan of her writing, but she'd hand me like amazingly written scenes and be the first person to say, I don't care if the actors say any of these words, just get the truth out of the performance. Mm -hmm. And when you're given that kind of freedom, and she's the first to be like, these words aren't working, let's rewrite the scene. Or, you know what, now that we've seen it, I think it's really about this, let's all go that way. And I mean, half the time in the middle of a scene, you would say, yeah, you know what, we don't need these four actors. You guys just go home, the scene's gonna be about this now. And then we'd rewrite, you know, I'd wait, she'd hand me pages and then we'd do that. And you see it when you see the show, it's so immediate and it's so, um, it stands apart as something so different because everyone, um, I think because she came from so many years of TV, what she kind of explained to me was the, was the um, not so much working with the TV model was was the idea that the guest director would come in, that nobody would give a shit about them because they were gonna be gone at the end of the week, and that the actors didn't really think you knew their character well, so they didn't wanna hear it from you. And then, you know, they would demand to see a showrunner. The showrunner's busy, like, doing showrunner stuff, so they would kick a sort of writer to the set, and the writer would mean well, but sort of inadvertently step on the director's toes trying to fix something and not really know what the production was doing. And then the director would just sort of check out and be like, well, no one gives a shit about me and take out their phone and kind of, and I was like, ooh, this is not, um, I don't know, why am I try <laughs> trying to do this for a living? Like it was sort of a weird, broken part of the system. And so she sort of said, what if we realize that all of this production is here to serve the actors and this performance and this story and not the other way around. So it's not about make your days and get the first shot off at a certain time. And um, what if it was about what's the truth of the scene and how do we go from there? And so that was a huge challenge of, okay, this is a really amazing vision of a showrunner, but then what I learned as being the only other producer director, which I'm sure she knows is, Nobody says no to the creator, so all those no's come to you. Like, all of those no's are like, okay, that's great. 
we got to get this shot off by nine, you know? And you're like, okay, but we're just going to sit here and listen to sad piano music for half an hour, and that's <laughs> what we're going to do. And it was, like, very challenging to find that role of, okay, you know the timeline, you know what turnaround is, you know what SAG rules are, and you've got to, like, keep serving this vision and doing this other thing. But also, as an artist, you really believe that, like, all of this is true, and how can we make better TV? Um, and then I went from that to, like, the Mindy Project, which is a super network show run so organized and so clean with the happiest people on the planet <laughs> and, like, so amazingly smooth. And they have this incredible producer-director named Michael Spiller who um, tells you everything you need to know and sets you up for success and then acts like a huge safety net under you the whole time and basically said, um, okay, show me why you're directing this episode. Because if you're just going to do a two-shot and coverage, coverage, I could direct every episode. So really do something special here. It still has to look like an episode of our show, but do your thing. you know. And that, I think, is such a beautiful way to make a network show, like that you, you know you have all the responsibilities of a network show, but you can still reach for doing something artistic and different. you know. And I think that show is really... Um, underrated in the sense that you watch it and it looks like a top romantic comedy when you really look at it, like a really beautifully lit single camera romantic comedy, you know, movie every episode. Um, but because they love directors and respect directors, and if you ask Mindy herself, like I said, oh, will you ever direct an episode? And she said, no, I really, really respect what directors do too much to, you know, to just dabble in it. And um, that when that comes from the top people, it goes all the way through the whole show, you know? Um, I don't know. Now I've gone so far out on a tangent that I don't know. Good tangent. <laughs> but it's good. I'm yeah. learning. Um, we're learning. Um, we have about But with Justin, too, like, he doesn't have, like, he basically said, you're directors I'm fans of. Make this episode yours. And so um, when I got my script and it had, like, four sex scenes, I was like, oh you know what would be more interesting is what if instead of a sex scene we did this, like the character is a film student, what if his fantasy was this fantasy from like nine and a half weeks or this fantasy from Bergman's, you know, persona, this, you know, and so then we just like departed from that and just made it a really cool other thing. But he's, you know, it's Netflix and you're, um, I think he really wants every episode to feel like it was directed by this person and feel different from the one before it and the one after it. We have about 15 minutes, and so I think we're going to open up questions to the audience. Sorry if this is a generic question, but I'm truly curious. If you were to go back and tell yourself a piece of advice when you were first starting out in the business, um, what, what would that piece of advice be? Mine would have been to get into TV a lot sooner than, because I was sort of the last indie holdout in New York while all my friends were, like, running you know, into this amazing world of television. And um, I kind of wish I had known about the television industry. Like, they don't teach you that at NYU Film School, and I didn't even know it existed. So I, I you know, super generic answer. I would have just said, like, get over there faster. Because there is this, like, I mean, everyone here, I guess, is in LA, so this is not good advice. But, you know, you are sort of circling Hollywood your whole career, and you have to, like, jump in at some point. Let me see. I would have told myself a couple of things. Be patient. Um, it's going to take time. I would have jumped into television a hell of a lot earlier. Um, but also trust your voice. Trust yourself as an artist. Uh, have confidence in yourself. Um, that I, you know. And there were times where I doubted myself because of how things go in your career. You don't get this job. You can't work here. But you have to hold on to that truth and know that you know, it's about continuing to get better. And then, but just don't forget, you know what you're doing, you know what you want to say as an artist. Um, and don't let anybody ever rob you of that. So for me, you know, I think that's one of the things that I, I've got now. But it would kind of wavered a little bit in the beginning because of trying to figure out, well, this works, um, this works, wait, this works, wait, but that's not me. Here's me, and that works. Um, and it proved that, yeah, you being yourself, that works <laughs> just fine, even better. So, um, but just having belief in myself, being very patient with it. And I'm still learning to be patient. 
Um, God, it's hard. I mean, I think that there is, uh, I think back to my younger self who, like there's a big disconnect between um, when you can start making money doing the thing that you're doing and, and when you're making work. And like I remember I was bartending at the standard on sunset, which couldn't have been more soul sucking. And I had just like one can and I like came back and I was like shaking an apple martini for some like German douchebag. And I was like, in my head, I was like, I just one can, like I just one can, like I was, I'm like there and I'm looking out at this bar of all these people just, you know, and it, but it is that feeling. And, you know, even I was in a Sundance program this year with like, and there was a filmmaker who had had two movies at Sundance that year. And he was like, I made $18,000 last year. Like, I cannot feed myself. Like, I'm sleeping on people's couches. I don't. And so there I was going, I don't know if I should go back to Orange is the New Black. Like, should I? Like, maybe I should go do, you know? And he was like, fuck you. Because, like, <laughs> you have a way to make money as a filmmaker and an artist. Like, how can you think about giving up that thing? But it is there are these like golden handcuff things where you, when you start to make money at something, it is very hard. And this is another thing we were talking about. Like when you're in a writer's room all day long, you leave and the last thing you want to do is think about story or work on your little pet project that is that thing that, you know, would be so cool but might be a million dollar movie or, you know, it's like very hard to do that. And as life goes on, it's like I now have this TV career. I am also pursuing a feature career. I want to keep making movies. I There's pressure to jump to the next level movie-wise, but I also want to make these small movies. And, you know, my TV agents are constantly like, well, why aren't you developing? And do you want a staff? And do you want it? Like, so it's, it's that saying, and I don't know who said it, and I wish I did because it's such a good quote, but it's that... Um, that Hollywood, success in Hollywood is like a pie eating contest when the prize is more pie. Like, where you've just made it through, you know, like my movie was just at Sundance and it's like, well, what are you doing now? Like, what is your next movie? And I'm like, I have a one-year-old and a two-year-old. I like, I'm so tired. I just want to stop. And so I do look back at my former self who was bartending and impatient and frustrated and all of these things and I'm like you are going to brunch and like you're going on hikes and like <laughs> you have nothing to do like like write that beautiful movie that's been you know so I think that there is a freedom before you have success that you don't really get to have once you have success because there's so many things pulling on you so I wish that I had been a little bit more patient you know, and sort of looked at where I was at and gone, you know what, I'm, I work from 10 till 2 in the morning and I make a lot, you know, cash and I do get to go on hikes and think about that story idea that I had and, and enjoying, enjoying the being poor artist part of it, which is an incredibly fertile and creative time and it's hard to see it when you're in it, but when you do start to have these kind of successful you know, careers and opportunities and doors opening, it also means that you are limited because you start making money. And um, I'm lucky that my parents are both artists and always said to me, like, keep your overhead small enough that you can continue to make good work your whole life. Like, don't ever buy that house in the Palisades where that means you have to go on that crappy network show because you just have to pay your pool boy. Like keep your life small enough that you can make the kind of work that you want to make. And, and I do think that's super important. And so if I could talk to my former self, it would be to be patient that looking back, you know, yes, it took my movie eight years to get made. In that time, I became a better writer. I became a better filmmaker. I learned about production. I, you know, suddenly had a name in the industry that helped my movie to get financed. So I think all of those things make sense in hindsight, but it's hard to see it when you're in it. So enjoy the brunches and hikes, I guess. Uh, what can I say that hasn't been said? Um, I would say all of the same things. Um, I think patience especially is really important. Um, finding a way to sustain yourself, whether it's living small enough or finding a TV gig on the side. Or for me, I wish I would have um, 
started developing my own show earlier. I, my agents were really encouraging me and I just had no interest in television at that time, even though I had ideas. Um, but two things come to mind that maybe haven't been said. One is that I would tell myself to relax. Um, I think I put so much pressure on myself and I, and I had somewhat of an opposite experience in that when I wasn't working, I was always working. So when I, I wasn't making money, I was totally broke, but I was pushing myself to constantly be churning something out, and it was shit. It was something I wasn't even that interested in, ultimately. You know, at the time I thought I was, and maybe I was working out something emotionally or psychologically, it was some form of cheap therapy. Um, but it was ultimately not something that I was ever gonna make. Um, and, and, you know, look, it probably taught me a lot, and I needed to do it but I think I would just relax and enjoy my life a little bit more. I wish I would have done that in, you know, previously and not been so driven by this sense of ambition because you just have to trust more that things are gonna happen when they're meant to happen as long as you're pushing yourself enough and really you know, kind of moving forward. But I would also say, kind of going along with that, what's really important is to choose projects that really matter to you really, really matter, and don't take on too much. Because I had a tendency to take on everything. And there was a point where I was, I, like after I made my first feature, I was so flattered that anybody wanted to offer me anything that I always wanted to say yes. So learn how to say no, because it took me way too long to figure that out. And I had just exhausted myself for no reason over projects that I, from the beginning, a part of me knew I never really wanted to be involved with it. So I think that's so incredibly important because um, I think I had a lot of opportunities to just focus in on the essential projects. And, and you know, I, I, I wasn't doing that. Instead, I was kind of um, spreading my focus too thin. So I think that's really important. How do you balance your personal life against all of the, the film life? That is, do you have children? Do you have family? Do you have a dating life? Maybe of some kind. <laughs> I was joking you, about this, that you know how in film they say you can have two of the three, like fast, cheap, or good? Yeah. And for me, it's like you can be a good mom, work, or take care of your relationship. Like you can do two of those things. You can't do all three of them at the same time. Like it, it just doesn't, I don't know. I mean, I have a kid and it's very much like my work is going really well and um, I'm being a really awesome mom right now, and everything else is gone to shit. Like, it's just, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I feel like I've been like a really slow, you know, I, I've been kind of like a late bloomer in this regard, like, because I, I always felt very strong. I, was, I always was terrified that I couldn't have the career I wanted and the family I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of ignored the family part for a while. It was sort of like, I'm just gonna really focus on this. And you know, it was like, what personal life? I mean, I had like kind of a dating life, but um, now that I have my career in a certain place and I'm, I have a partner now and it's sort of like, we're talking about starting a family, but it's sort of, I feel like I needed to get my career to a place first where I could even really turn my attention mm -hmm. to a personal life and a family and really put energy into that. Um, I just, previously felt like I, I couldn't, even though I wanted to, I felt like I couldn't do it and, until, really until very recently, like the last two years. I think um, I, I've been on so many like panels about women filmmakers especially, and it's sort of the thing that no one really wants to talk about because it's really hard, no matter how supportive and involved your partner is, I think, um, the mom ends up being sort of the, the needed caregiver a lot of the time. And so, um, you know, I, I was trying to get my movie made for so many years and I wanted to have a baby and I was like, well, I can't because my movie's going to go in the spring and then it would get pushed to the fall and it was like, well, I can't have a baby because my movie's going to go in the fall. And, and finally I was like, oh, I need to have, this movie might never get made and <laughs> I should probably just have a baby if I want to have a baby. <laughs> um, and then, of course, when my movie got made, I was, I had a 16-month-old and I was six months pregnant. Um, and, and it was the most inopportune time it could ever have happened. And I, 
you know, I w was again in the Orange Writers Room. My movie was going to go. I went to Genji and I sort of said, you know, oh my God, like my movie's happening and I, I need to leave. And she said, okay, we'll go make your movie and come back when you're done. And I'm like, and I'm pregnant. <laughs> um, and so that was just not going to happen. And I, I, I left the editing room. I mean, no joke. Like I left the editing room, locked picture on my movie at 3 p.m., went into labor that night. Um, <laughs> Like, was back in the editing room two weeks later to do my VFX and work with my composer. My composer saw more of my boobs than <laughs> anyone should ever see because I was nursing in the room. So I think as a woman, you are juggling more. Like, if you have a family and a relationship or whatever, like, you do, you do end up, especially with kids, juggling a lot more. And it's hard because there's a perception as a woman... You know, if you were a guy and you wanted your kids around while you were shooting, I think there'd be a perception of, like, what a great dad, you know? But as a woman, you sort of have to be, like, pretend your kids don't exist or something because that would be you not doing your job. Or And so on this last job, like, my kids came out for pre-production um, with my husband, and they were there, and then they flew back while I was shooting, and then the shoot kept getting pushed. They were like, we're going to push a day, we're going to, and then suddenly it went pushed over a three-day weekend, and I had an 11-month-old and a two-year, and I was like, gone for way too long, and so I think it made me realize, like, it's, it might be worth it to do that for my feature, it might not be worth it when my kids are so young to do that for a show that I'm maybe not as invested in, so I think it is hard choices, and um, like Nisha was saying, I think you you always feel like you're failing at something. You know, you're not giving attention to your partner or you're not um, giving your full attention to your work or you're a bit unprepared that day because your kid was up all night. So I think it's it's hard to do all of it, but I don't think you can really plan it because this industry is so fickle and things don't time out really ever in relation to your life, maybe the way that they should. And there was something very creative about making a baby and a movie at the same time, and it probably happened that way for a reason. So I think sometimes you just have to be an insane person and juggle it all to make it happen, but yeah, it's not easy. Let me see, I don't have kids yet, but I have put, all, I put it off for so long because it was either, oh wait, I don't have the money, or wait a minute, we gotta go make this feature, or wait a minute, we gotta go do this, we can't do this, we, you know, and now you see yourself and you're like, okay, almost 40 or 40s, and then you're like, I want another family. I, I just took away 10 years focusing on career and not doing it, and now finally taking the chance to like, okay, now we're trying to start our family. Um, and knowing that that's something that's possible. It's scary as hell. And the more y'all talk about it over here, it just gets scarier. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing that is empowering is that you can do it. You can have it. You just need to know one of those things won't work out. But all the other two. You will <laughs> ruin your kids, time. but okay. it's fine. Okay, yeah, so my kid is going to work out. So, okay, things. I'm sorry for my wife and my job. One of y'all got to go, apparently. For now, <laughs> no, no, like, no. It no. rotates. You're yeah. good at two we'll at rotate. a time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and the not all production three at triangle. The same time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, but, you know, but taking that time, I just wish I hadn't delayed having a family for so long uh, because of fear of what it was. And now also making sure that, you know, the question is, oh, which one of you are gonna carry? And you're in the directing thing and having that fear come across people's eyes. And I'm like, well, she's carrying, but, and then you see a relief come and that hurts <laughs> because it's like, what, I can't direct? I mean, this woman just was nursing and everything else. Are you can't telling me like I couldn't direct and carry my child? But you're given that advice. Like you don't bring up that you have a kid when you're interviewing for a job because it's a strike against you for sure. Like if you're a woman, they're gonna think you'd rather be home with your kid, you know, instead of, oh, she has a family to provide for. But yeah. most of us are the breadwinners of the family and it's still, it's just a, it's a, it's just a thing that will change with a lot of time. I, I so. gotta say, you guys are really inspiring me. I mean, I want. I, I hope to God I can soon be big, fat, pregnant woman going in and directing. <laughs> I really, I really, really want to be big, pregnant, and directing. 
And I'm bringing my kids do to set. Do it in your second trimester. I'm going to show it I'm going to bring my kids to set. Yeah. Uh-huh. I said do it in your second trimester. That's when you're like a superhero. You feel like a superhero. And that's when you yeah. do it. And I'm bringing my kids to set. Yeah. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. I mean, you can't. There's no choice. You have to. Like, there's no choice. Because you will never see them if you don't. Oh, okay. Like, it just has to happen. Okay. <laughs> So I want to thank you all so much for coming in. When they told me we were premiering at the Los Angeles Film Festival, I was like, yes! I was screaming! (laughs) We feel uh, very excited. So grateful to be here. Fucking amazing. Excuse my language. (laughs)